Hey, everybody, it's time for another PC Perspective mailbag, and I will tell you up front there's a lot of stuff going on here, so expect to see people moving back and forth, uh, maybe some noise, maybe some expletives, maybe some, some notifications going on around here. I'll do my best to keep it as contained as I can, uh, but let's get to some questions. Ken225 asks, any chance that you guys can make an audio-only version of the mailbag? I'd love to listen to it as a podcast. Uh, you know, we've had a couple of requests for this, um, and I think we could probably do that and just put it in the normal PC Perspective podcast RSS feed, I guess. Um, I assume, Ken, that's what you're asking for, an audio-only version, something that is automatically downloaded um, just like our podcast would be. So you'd have the podcast downloaded on Thursday, the mailbag downloaded on Friday, I guess. Um, so that would probably work. And obviously we would just link to the, the MP3 file on the website. Uh, that, that's getting into a little bit more production than we need because now we got to upload things differently. we got to create and maintain another RSS file. But uh, I'll see if we can make it happen. Um, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Uh, here's a question from Nebu Thomas. Can a game be developed with both DirectX and OpenGL slash Vulkan, or does the developer have to pick just one? Um, no, a game can absolutely be developed in both DirectX and OpenGL, or OpenGL and Vulkan, or DirectX and Vulkan, or all three, actually. And I think there are, there's a handful of examples out there that do use all three, something like uh, Ashes of the Singularity that existed in Mantle, uh, OpenGL, DirectX, and Vulkan now as well. The, the, the part of it um, to, to understand is like a lot of these tools, a lot of the software tools, a lot of the APIs, a lot of the, uh, not APIs, a lot of the things that game developers utilize to build a game are cross-platform, cross-API. So that makes it a little bit easier. Anything custom that they're writing, you know, is probably built to interact with multiple APIs or can be built to interact with multiple APIs. So there's no reason a game, you know, from an assets consideration, or whatever, it just adds more work to the game developer. How many code paths do they want to create? And depending on what engine they're using, if they're building their own engine, they're using somebody else's engine, a lot of that work may be taken care of for them. So that's something else to keep in mind, right? As DirectX 12 and Vulkan become more popular, I think the emphasis on on game engines like Unreal and Unity and that type of stuff will become more important as we go and more uh, decisive in, in how what game developers actually use. So yes, no reason why they can't use those at the same time. Gary Hughley, Hugh, Gary Hughley wants to know, when are we going to see more AMD solutions in laptops? Most of the AMD and even Intel news lately seems, about, seems to be about desktops. Are more people using desktops than laptops. Uh, so there's several questions there. Um, so I would say most of the AMD and Intel news lately being about desktops is true. Um, a lot of that was centered around the fact that AMD Ryzen, uh, Ryzen Threadripper uh, were released. Those are desktop platforms. They create competition in the desktop area. Um, you know, going up Intel Core i5, i3, i7, you know, HEDT, Skylake X, Broadwell E. Um, it just created more competition, which kind of built more news. Reviews came out about it, you know, new motherboards coming out, new things coming out to support those platforms. So it kind of is a, uh, a self feeding cycle, if you will. Uh, there's still plenty of stuff going on in notebooks, but it's up until. Up until the future, I guess, it's all been about Intel, right? AMD hasn't really had much news happening in the notebook world. Um, you know, we had Kaby Lake, which first appeared as a notebook processor, dual-core hyper-threaded. We have Kaby Lake R that has been announced, otherwise known as the eighth generation that is still Kaby Lake. So that's quad-core Kaby Lake processors for notebooks. We've seen machines from Lenovo and Dell and Asus and others be announced using that processor, but I haven't had my hands on any of them yet to tell you what it is. The goal there is to offer significantly more multi-threaded performance with a dual-core hyper-threaded configuration, um, but still better uh, matching or better single-threaded performance, depending on what it is, all within same, all inside the same 15-watt thermal envelope, which I think we've talked about before. Uh, I know we've talked about it on the podcast and on this uh, question and answer show as well. Um, so there's still news there. Uh, are more people using desktops rather than laptops? Depends on what your audience is. For our audience, I don't think so. I think for our audience, you know, of enthusiasts and gamers, desktops are still more popular. But if you talk about computing in general, yes, more people are using laptops than desktops. So it really depends on, on what your, your market is there. I would say in general, the laptop market is significantly larger. I mean, go to any retail establishment where 
a non do it yourself gamer is going to go look for for PCs. You're going to find, you know, my Best Buy is going to have 30 laptops out and five desktop PCs from Asus or Lenovo or HP, right? So uh, there's definitely a discrepancy there. Now, if you look at, you know, businesses, a lot of times they're still buying desktops because they're cost efficient for the amount of performance you get. They're easier to manage, easier to build, repair, etc. Uh, so there's some mixes there. Uh, and in terms of your first question about when we're going to see more AMD solutions in laptops, uh, we, we did see Lenovo announce the first ThinkPad with an AMD processor in it a couple of weeks ago. Nothing stellar there it was using a you know a, a modern generation apu but the amd will have significantly more to add to the mobile story with the release of raven ridge which will be in q4 at some point raven ridge is the code name for the amd apu that features quad core zen processor and vega graphics uh, all on die so that will be where things get really interesting right they're going to re-enter um, the the notebook market they claim that they're going to have like 15 and 35 watt components there, which will go up against some of the higher end um, thin and lights against Intel. And based on everything that we're just kind of guessing, right, we can assume that the CPU performance will be pretty good for that part, but not as good as Intel CPUs. But the GPU will actually be significantly better than the integrated GPU on Intel's parts. So it'll create an interesting dynamic of who's interested in gaming, who's interested in non-gaming but GPU compute workloads like OpenCL acceleration for some applications. Uh, and it'll be a really compelling Q4, I think, in the build up to CES and, and how Raven Ridge starts to affect things. So keep an eye out for that. Dark Wizzy asks, would having faster RAM effectively give your CPU higher IPC rating? Um, you, let me see. That's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, yes, it would, um, because the memory transactions are returning quicker. So thus, those threads are able to complete their processing earlier and your um, uh, the amount of instructions that can be completed, completed per clock would in fact go up yes so faster ram would effectively give your cpu a higher ipc rating um, but it's interesting because if you look at on the intel side memory frequency doesn't really affect performance metrics significantly but on the amd side it's completely the opposite right especially if you look at something like gaming lower you know 1080p resolution gaming you're going to see a dramatic change going from ddr4 for 2400 to ddr4 3200 um big big jumps in performance there which is you know in th you're, it's absolutely true because your your cpu is not changing clock speeds but its performance is improving so kind of in uh, in a roundabout way yeah your instructions per clock is going to increase but in general ipc can be looked at from a, a um, scientific standpoint as what is the maximum throughput of the processor, you know, in a best case scenario, even. So that's usually what we talk about by IPC, but effectively, yes, Dark Wizzy, you are correct. Peter, ba Peter Baldry wants to know if my CPU has an integrated GPU and I install a discrete GPU into my system, what happens to the integrated GPU? Does it simply turn off or can it boost performance elsewhere? Uh, that really depends on a couple of things. One, the the motherboard's default behavior, um, and two, what we're what generation of product we're talking about, right? So uh, most motherboards, when you install discrete graphics, will give preference to the discrete graphics card, right? So if you have a Core i7 7700K, you install a GTX 1080, it's going to default to sending output default output through the GTX 1080. Uh, that's where Windows is going to default to, but what usually happens and what we would expect to happen is that in the BIOS, you can in, you can leave the integrated GPU enabled. It doesn't inherently have to be disabled. If you leave it enabled, you can use that for external displays, for you know added displays you can connect still to the motherboard connections. Um, you can use it for capabilities like QuickSync, which is Intel's you know hardware uh, accelerated encode decode blocks on their on their GPU um, that will allow you to do like handbrake transcoding quicker than normal, even than you can do on uh, on a NVIDIA GTX 1080 or on a CPU directly. So there's still benefits to doing that. <clears throat> um, that's where it can boost performance. There used to be a time where AMD would offer their APUs that had integrated graphics, and if you had a, a discrete GPU of a certain 
uh, range, performance range, then you could combine them and it would do you know graphics boost technology, sort of like Crossfire. Um, but that became very complicated because the GPUs are very different performance levels, and thus balancing that workload was very hard. And even now, as we look at multi-GPU, SLI, and Crossfire, and Windows 10 with DX12 and Vulkan, it's even less possible for AMD or NVIDIA to even you know do that manually. It's more on the game developer. So I think that's probably an idea that's time has passed. We may see it redone again when Raven Rage comes out and you know AMD talks about combining the power with it. I, mostly, I would look at it as extra storage controller, or I'm sorry, extra display controllers, uh, and any kind of integrated processing tech that's on that that isn't on your discrete GPU. You'll be able to to be able to take advantage of it. So no, it doesn't. Uh, simply turn off when you add one of those in. Curlin M asks, aside from possible vendor greed, why are Vega, Vega cards still priced so high over MSRP? This uh, is where we attempt to educate those who uh, don't or don't want to understand what the, like, how the economic systems of uh, supply and demand actually work, right? And, and this was explained to me in, in an interesting way once uh, about what is what is the value of something? How much should a video card sell for? And the truth is a video card should sell for whatever uh, it can sell for while properly balancing availability and pricing. So if... A Vega card is selling out today at $599, then it should probably still be priced at $599. Now, that's not the news people want to hear or what gamers want to hear, but for certain, but for AMD, um, you know, they have this AMD and NVIDIA, they want gamers to get their cards. They want that ecosystem to exist because it allows them to buy into FreeSync or buy into G-Sync and other technologies which will, they think, in theory, keep them coming back to those GeForce or Radeon products in the future. But the truth of the matter is, um, just because the cost of the silicon or the cost of the board or the cost of this performance class of GPU and the generation or two generations previous was some number, it doesn't really inherently mean anything going forward. Um, you know, the 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 margin or markup or profit margin of of any of these systems is not set in stone right and and and, and a lot of times we as gamers feel up feel like not obligated we feel like we deserve to have these cards priced at a certain amount or we deserve to have a certain performance improvement on on a on a yearly cadence at the same price point and that just doesn't happen right and and it's even more complicated because of cryptocurrency and mining and all these types of things are are dramatically affecting the the supply of products in the system or in the in the channel so it's not greed as much as it is as it is sensibility right so if if I'm getting in 100 cards a week of Vega and I can sell them for 600 bucks and I sell 99 of them every week for 600 bucks, then I'm going to keep selling them for $600. Uh, however, the first week that I get in 100 and I only sell 40 of them for 600 bucks, I'm going to start to worry. And so now I'm going to, maybe I'm going to sell these for 550 and now I'm back up to 80 of them I'm selling every week. And so this is a balance that goes back and forth. Um, if they weren't selling guys, they w they wouldn't be priced that high. Newegg and Amazon and AMD and their partners aren't going to want to have cards priced at seven hundred bucks just to have them sit on a shelf. But if their price is six hundred and they're selling, they're going to keep selling them that way. And there's really nothing we can do to change it. AMD will say that they can't change it because of legality reasons. I say they can't change it because it's just that's just the way it is. And despite. Um, what some people want to believe that these that these corporations have um, this desire to do the right thing by the customer all the time. It's nice that that's that that's there and that some people have that mentality inside a company. But at the end of the day, it's a company. It's a corporation. It's about profitability um, and it's about doing the best you can with the resources and the products that are given to you at any given point. So maybe not an uplifting answer, but uh, an answer nonetheless. Eric Elsinger, next question. If I upgrade my processor but do not change any other components, will I need to reinstall Windows or reset my BIOS settings after the upgrade? Or will everything just work? That's a, like a $100,000 question you got there, Eric. Um, in theory, if you're upgrading from 
say uh, you've got a Z270 motherboard and you have a what is a Haswell processor and you have that on a Z270 for whatever reason, you want to upgrade to a Skylake processor, you should just be able to replace that CPU um, as long as your BIOS supports it, right? So actually the best thing to do is to update your BIOS before you upgrade your processor and then change your processor over to the new one. Now it will Windows will do rediscovery of new uh, hardware because you're basically adding a new PCI Express controller, new memory controllers, new processors. Uh, it will redetect things like your video cards or any accessories in the in the system. Um, drivers might have to be reinstalled, um, but you shouldn't have to change other components, right? As long as memory supports the same or whatever. But as we have found over the last recent several generations of stuff, uh, sorry for the uh, weed eating going on over there. Um, the <laughs> Uh, the, the problem is we've seen not many processor upgrade cycles in between motherboard cycles, right? So we've almost been on this one-to-one, -one, maybe one-to-two cadence of chipsets to processors, uh, which, you know, in the past, you maybe could get three out of every once in a while. I'm trying to think like Sandy Bridge, Ivy Bridge, Broadwell, kind of in that range as well. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's worth 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 thinking of there but no you shouldn't have to reinstall windows uh, or reset anything else because of that um, but just be prepared as always back up your important stuff you know have a dropbox account do something so everything's in the cloud in case something does happen and you do have to reinstall windows you don't uh, lose all of your data along the way but you shouldn't have to uh, here is a question from Louis Louis Bosio Faro Louis Bosio Faro I don't know. Sorry, guys. I currently have a 1080p 144 hertz FreeSync monitor with an RX 480. I want to upgrade, but AMD cards are obviously hard to find right now. I'm therefore thinking of switching to a GTX 1070. Since I won't have a G-Sync display, what should I do to minimize screen tearing? Well, that's a good question, actually, because you've got a high refresh rate display. Um, if, if screen tearing is particularly annoying to you, you've got a couple of options. One, you could lower the maximum refresh of your screen uh, to, like, say, 60 or 100 hertz if, that, if the game you play most frequently um, is somewhere around there or your frame rate's generally a little bit above that. The other thing I would, I would suggest you try to do is just enable VSync, right? If your frame rate is high enough, um, then the uh, uh, the kind of sync issue you get with being out of uh, out of sync, I guess, between your frame rate and your refresh rate may not be as painful as you think it might be, right? Like on the low end, if you have a 60 hertz panel and you're running at 50 frames per second, that's pretty bad. But if you have a 144 hertz panel and you're running at 120 frames per second, you're, don't get me wrong, you're still going to have uh, frame doubling, uh, you know, frame... Uh, uh, mismatches and stutters and shutters every once in a while, but it may be harder for you to detect. So I would actually try that first. That gets rid of all the screen tearing, um, but maybe presents you with uh, the best overall experience. And the other option is to lower your refresh rate to 60, 100, uh, so that you know your render rate, your frame rate is gonna be is gonna be higher than that. So those are those are a couple of options. Or sell your FreeSync monitor, save up a little bit more money and, and get that get the equivalent g-sync display but uh, i think there are a lot of people in your scenario that that want to upgrade to some amd option but uh, the nvidia cards are still a little bit a uh, little bit easier to find uh, let's do one more question uh, we'll do two more uh, el poker el poker el poker el poker and again weed eating over here i'm quite confused about the rumors of 32 core threadripper chips Videos from overclockers like uh, Der Bauer seem to show that the supposed the dummy dies actually have cores and circuitry and are simply disabled on the 1950X. This leads some to believe that 32 core 64 thread thread ripper parts are on the way, but I think that would require activating full dies and using octa channel memory like Epic. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, it wouldn't require octa channel memory, eight channel memory, but it would. It would be stupid to not. Uh, I don't think this is happening. I think this, you know, the Epic product line that goes up to 32 cores. They want. They don't want to. Um, they don't want to uh, take away from the 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 what makes that product line so good for AMD in the in the server and high end workstation market. Um, so I don't think that's going to case. The, I mean, the the even though those dies have now been discovered to not be blank, which is what AMD originally told us, and in fact. 
um, may be ha or may have circuitry and transistors and all that stuff on them, it doesn't mean they're good die, right? So even though they're they're using the same socket, AMD still claims they're using different substrates, um, and so there's no actual physical connection between those two places where those bad dies are uh, and the good ones. The bad ones are there to balance out the heat spreader, uh, help heat dissipation, um, keep the heat spreader from caving in, uh, we were told originally. So even though now they may be there may be dyes on there that have transistors. It doesn't really change their function and, and their usefulness. Also, I, it's possible that those dyes on there might actually be functional, uh, but it seems less likely. Chances are what AMD is doing is they're – keep in mind that they only make one dye. The Zeppelin dye is used for Ryzen uh, 3, 5, and 7. It's used for Threadripper. It's used for Epic. So um, the only part they have to worry about this on is on Threadripper. So they need two bad dye in order to fill these two blank spots to balance out heat spread – you know, prevent uh, crushing, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so all they do is they go through their yields and dyes that are bad, rather than going to the recycling or to the garbage, go into this stack that then be used to be placed in these two locations on the, the Threadripper substrate. Uh, and my guess is, hopefully, they're an intelligent pl uh, company. Rather than use good ones there, they would, uh, if they run out of bad dye, Rather than use good dye to fill in that space, they would actually use blank dye that you can get for, you know, a buck a piece, as opposed to wasting a good working Zeppelin dye that could be in a hundred dollar processor or five hundred dollar processor. So uh, I don't think the the rumors of a thirty two core sixty four thread Threadripper part are accurate yet, because um, that's not really a Threadripper part. That's an Epic part. Um, could they do that? Could they bring Epic to it and make it a, a, a still just a quad channel? I, they probably could. And, you know, when after Intel launches their 16 and 18 core processors next week, um, they may decide to do something crazy like that. But I just I just don't foresee it. I don't foresee it. Uh, all right. Last question. Uh, in in con in asks, do you still have faith in Dalton and the offense? We're talking about the Cincinnati Bengals here because I was wearing the Bengals jersey. Last Thursday when I recorded this because it was a Thursday night football game that we lost. Uh, what will it take for you to wear this year's inevitable Super Bowl champs jersey on either the next PC per live stream or mailbag? Hashtag Lions all the way 2810. Uh, I have nothing against wearing opposing jerseys. I'm a Bengals fan. I'm a, I'm a, a, a UK basketball fan, UK football fan. Uh, but I'm not like opposed to other teams. I have Peterson jerseys. I have Seahawks jerseys. I have other stuff that I that I use sometimes. So, uh, you know, if you want to send me a Lions jersey, I'll wear it on the next podcast for you. Um, uh, but to your first question, do I have faith in Dalton in the offense? Um, it hasn't gone away completely. We did just fire our offensive coordinator. So there's, there's still a chance. Still a chance for us. So thank you guys for your questions. If you have questions, leave them in the comment section below here, uh, and we will filter through those. Or you can leave them on the PCPer.com page that has this specific mailbag video on it, and we'll go through those and answer those as well uh, on our next episode. So thank you guys for joining us. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, also, if you like this type of stuff, keep us in mind uh, for our Patreon, patreon.com slash PCPer. Go there if you want to do a uh, regular monthly contrib contribution to, uh, to the content we write here and create. So thanks, guys. See you next time. Mm -hmm.